Welcome to this walk through Philippians 3, verses 7 through 11. In the previous section, we heard Paul warning the Philippians about a Judaizing form of Christianity. And Paul had said that through his own lineage and his own achievements, he had actually attained the righteousness that they're promoting. But now we hear Paul contrasting all of that with what he has in Christ. Verse 7 is our first sentence. Al hatina ein moi kerde, tauta hege mai dia ton kriston zemian. So, if we're going to read the word Allah, notice that some manuscripts uh, don't have it. But hatina, whatever, uh, neuter plural, whatever was for me gain. Uh, moi, a dative of advantage. Tauta, these things, hege mai, perfect from hege amai. I have come to consider dia ton kriston, because of Christ, or because of the Messiah, zeimian, loss. So we have hege amai with the double accusative of object and complement. I have come to consider these things to be loss. It's interesting, Paul doesn't say he's come to consider them to be unimportant or secondary, but actual loss. I wonder if perhaps uh, part of the reason is that uh, these very privileges and attainments are what led him to reject Messiah and persecute his people and become the chief of sinners, as Paul describes in 1 Timothy 1.15. Or it may just be a more general kind of contrast, but it is certainly a stark contrast. And then our verb, heget am I, uh, notice I'm saying, showing you it's a middle preference verb, all my ending. And Neva Miller, in her discussion of middle preference verbs, puts this in class three, verbs of self-involvement. And the first category within that is intellectual activity. In other words, what she says, processes that the subject alone can experience for himself. That's page 428 in Neva Miller. At the end of the video, I'll include the, a bibliography uh, so you can look up some of these sources uh, if you're not familiar with them already. Our second sentence goes through the rest of our whole passage for today. So we'll just take it bit by bit. So verse 8. Allah menunge kai hegyumai panta zemi an enai dia ta hyperechon tes genosa os Christu Jesu tu kiriu mu. So we begin with interesting Conjunctions here, Allah and then Menunga, made up of men and un and ge. Now in classical Greek, uh, it's very common to see the combination men and un. And it's either used um, in an inferential way, the un being therefore, and sort of um, looking ahead uh, from the point that's just been made, uh, or else the un is more a uh, matter of emphasis. And it can even have an adversative sense of uh, no or rather. And that, I think, is probably what's going on here. A, a number of scholars point to it as being inferential, but I don't see how that's the case here. And BDAG notes that this uh, menunge can either emphasize or correct. And so what would the correcting interpretation mean? Well, we could translate it woodenly, but um, somewhat like English, no, but rather, in fact, I even consider. Uh, no, but rather, in fact, I even consider. Because the ge is often uh, emphatic, adding a note of emphasis. So Paul's making what already includes a certain amount of emphasis even more emphatic with adding the ge there. Interestingly, while BDAG, the large Danker lexicon, gives both options of either emphasis or correction, in his concise lexicon he only has the emphasis, uh, not the correction. So, uh, whichever way you're going to take this, um, we have hegumai from hegeamai again, uh, now the present tense. So, no, but rather, in fact, I even am considering or consider panta zemian enai. I'm considering everything to be loss. And now he actually gives the infinitive ani in there. Up here we had the double accusative of object and complement, which is uh, sort of implying an ani in between the two accusatives. But here we actually have it stated. 
And so he's moved on from the Hatina to Panta, from whatever he's had in the past to absolutely everything. It's a very total comment. So I'm, I consider everything to be loss. Dia with the accusative because of the huperechon teskenosos. Now huperechon, that's a participle, meaning to excel or surpass. And so sometimes translated uh, the surpassing greatness or supreme good, literally the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So Christu would be an objective genitive after gnosos. It's the, what the knowledge is about, the knowledge of Christ, Jesus, and then my Lord being an apposition. But what do we make of this huperechon? Well, it's a participle and it's substantive, but it seems here to be functioning like an adjective. And you can check out Wallace's Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, pages 89 and 90, for this uh, kind of usage. So, in other words, we could translate this something like the excellency of the knowledge, uh, meaning excellency is a quality of the knowing of Jesus. Excellency is describing the knowledge. So now Paul makes clear that the reason everything else is loss um, is because of how, in contrast, how great the knowledge of Christ is. Uh, just not knowledge about him, but an actual relational knowledge not just recognizing Jesus as the Lord, where he thought differently before, but he's my Lord. Very personal. Dihon tapanta etzemiothen, because of whom I have suffered the loss, there's passive, from zemiao, same word family as the zemian. Uh, I've suffered the loss of the whole thing, tapanta, the totality. He could be referring to uh, his loss of position within Judaism after having become a follower of Christ. But as our passage goes on, it looks like there's more involved than that. Where Paul goes on to say, Kai hegumai skubala in the Christon kerdeso. And I'm considering, I consider, uh, same verb we saw. Um, now we're missing our direct object, so supply it from here, tapanta. Uh, I'm considering everything skubala. And there's a lot of discussion about this word. The best I can make of it, it would mean something like filth. It can be used as a word regarding different kinds of what you might call filth, like excrement or garbage. So it doesn't mean exactly excrement or garbage uh, or the rest of it, but it has this more sense of that um, unclean and filthy in some ways. It's a strong word. It's a coarse word but not just one particular kind of filth, but very strong. Notice now Paul says he's doing the considering. This is how he views things. He's come to view thing, everything in contrast to Christ as being this extreme opposite. So the role of the mind here is interesting, and it's interesting throughout Paul. The use of hegeomai in this passage, uh, logizomai in Romans and elsewhere. Here he, Paul is saying that he's essentially detaching from everything. It reminds me of our Lord saying um, that unless you hate mother and father, you can't be my disciple. It doesn't mean we're supposed to literally hate them, but it means in contrast to our attachment to him, every other uh, relation, even the most intimate and the most um, godly in many ways, is such a contrast. It, there's just no comparison. So it's an expression of utter attachment to Christ and utter detachment from everything else on some level. Uh, and he's detaching from everything else. He's considering it to be skubala, uh, so that, hina, kriston, kerdeso, so that I might gain Christ. So all these things that could have been gain, now what he's after is gaining Christ. And part of the way to do that is to put Christ first in such a way that everything else is uh, a far distant second. So he wants to gain Christ, kai hyuratho in auto, and that I might be found in him. So another subjunctive here. So we've got a hina clause with two subjunctives. So that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Many take this as an epexigenic use of kai. In other words, it's a restatement and an explanation of the earlier statement. You can check out Hellerman's uh, commentary on page 185 for that approach. Uh, so that I might gain Christ, that is, or namely, or i.e., 
be found in him. It doesn't seem to work very well, at least uh, to my way of thinking. It seems these are not the same thing. The gaining and the being found uh, are two different stages. You've got the journey and the arrival. Uh, looks to me to be what's going on with the two words instead of two ways of saying the same thing. But they are obviously closely related. The gaining of Christ and being found in him that's what the gaining is about in some ways, but is it exactly the same thing? Well, that's uh, something to consider. And so Paul goes on to unpack this uh, being found in him. And he does so with this next uh, participial clause. Me echon. Emein de kaisunein tein ek namu. Ala tein dia pista os Christu. Tein ek theu de kaisunein epi te piste. So not having uh, my righteousness, a little bit of emphasis there using uh, the possessive adjective, my righteousness, that which is from the law, but the righteousness understood through faith of Christ, the from God upon the faith. So I translated that very woodenly because there's several issues to talk about here. This participle echon is often taken as causal or modal, uh, because uh, I don't have, or by not having, I suppose substantival uh, works as well. That might be found in him, one who does not have um, my own righteousness, that kind of idea. So those are all uh, ways we can get at that. And dikaiosune here, my righteousness, anarthrus, uh, could be pointing to the qualitative feature of this, the kind of righteousness he's talking about, righteousness which is from the law. So my righteousness is going to be from the law because I've kept it perfectly, like he described earlier. So in contrast to that, but the righteousness which is through faith of Christ. So here we get the big issue of whether Christu is subjective genitive or objective genitive. Is this but the righteousness which is through faith in Christ, or is it the righteousness which is through Christ's faithfulness? Christ himself being then the subject of the verbal idea here. And peace, this means faithful in many contexts, uh, or faith, it could mean a number of different things, like you can see in the lexicons uh, along those lines. And then he goes on, the righteousness from God upon faith. So based on faith, perhaps. And so he's contrasting my righteousness with a righteousness from God. It comes from God. And it's based upon faith. Well, if we take epi as meaning based upon faith, then I think that points to this as a subjective genitive over here. Because our righteousness is not based on our faith. It's based on Christ and what he has done for us in his own faithfulness, which we receive through faith. So I think there's a, a good case you could make here for this being the subjective genitive. So I don't have my own righteousness, which is from the law, but I have a righteousness that comes through the faithfulness of Christ, which is from God, and based upon his faithfulness. So the te here, taking that as a possessive use of the article, which is a common usage. So that would be one way of uh, interpreting this, which I think has got something to commend itself. Uh, but others, of course, take it differently. And you can see Hellerman, uh, who has a nice layout of the two options, and he comes down on the objective side. So I'm thinking it's the subjective side, and uh, that would flow from the Christ hymn back in chapter 2. The word faithfulness isn't used there in chapter 2, but it's certainly a description of Christ as the faithful one who um, suffered even to the point of death on a cross. Now, the sentence goes on with this uh, articular infinitive, genoni, from genosco. So let's look at the map to see some options here. So the infinitive could be parallel with the Hena clause, providing uh, yet another form of purpose. But as Fee points out and others, um, that would be unusual grammar for Paul to use an infinitive uh, as, instead of a second Hena clause. And so... More likely it goes with hiuretho, giving the goal of being found in Christ. So check out fee page 327 for that. And Hellerman also cites that on page 189. But this uh, knowing him is part of the gaining of Christ. And so it's part of the whole complex of what went before in some ways. 
So to know him, to genonai auton, kai tein dunamin teis anastasa osautu, and the power of his resurrection, kai tein koyonion ton patematon autu, and the fellowship of his sufferings. And so I've got those laid out right underneath the auton um, as this, going with the genonai, to know him and power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his now, once again, some people take these chi's here as epexegetic. Check out Hellerman, page 189, for this. So that to know him means to know the power of his resurrection and so forth. This is grammatically possible, but I think it depersonalizes this knowledge. So it seems better to take auton as the more comprehensive personal experience and an encounter with the person of Christ and the power of his resurrection and the communion with his sufferings are core aspects of that experience as one is united to Christ and is with Christ on the road of discipleship and living into um, our union in Christ and with Christ. Now you see there's brackets around these two articles here because some manuscripts uh, don't have them. And if those were not in the text, then we'd have what Wallace calls a TSKS construction. In other words, a single article with a substantive chi substantive. So that, uh, when that happens, uh, the, the two parts are joined together quite intimately. They're two, two aspects of a, of a single reality. And of course, that makes sense here, but that'd be true either way. So, summorfizomenos, conformed to the image, being conformed to the image, either a temporal participle or perhaps instrumental or modal, so being conformed to his death, to thanato autu, a pos katanteso, if perhaps or somehow I might attain, estein exanastasen tein ek nekron, unto the resurrection from the dead. Since the subject of an infinitive is normally in the accusative, we would expect an accusative participle here, but this is what's known as an ad sensum. Uh, construction according to the sense so being conformed to his death or with his death so again a reference back to the Christ hymn and we have sort of a chiasm going on here the power of his resurrection being a and then B the fellowship of his sufferings B prime being conformed to his death then a prime if somehow I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead we also have the already and not yet, because already we can know the power of his resurrection, even if we've not yet attained to the uh, resurrection from the dead. So the already and the not yet. And Paul's not yet there, if somehow I might attain. Uh, he's striving. There's striving that's necessary, and the next verse is going to emphasize that in our next passage. You can see that in other passages in Paul, like Colossians 1.28. Uh, we proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature, teleon, in Christ. And that language of uh, perfection or maturity, uh, teleos, uh, that will show up in the coming verses here in our passage uh, as well. So we have in our passage a lot to be studied and uh, reflected on, dig deeper into, um, an incredible picture of one who is utterly locked in on, centered on Christ as the means of being centered in and attached to God and itself reflecting the life of Christ that we saw back in the Christ hymn. Now I'll conclude this video by simply showing you a bibliography of the resources I refer to most frequently in this series. Here are two of the main lexicons, the large one by Danker and the intermediate one by Danker, the smaller one. Occasionally I refer to Montanari's recent large comprehensive lexicon for ancient Greek uh, right down through the early centuries of the church, the patristic, as well as all the classical stuff and everything in between, then Abbott Smith's manual Greek lexicon, which is one of my favorites. And a couple of the grammars uh, that I refer to, especially Wallace. Here's Neva Miller's very helpful brief article. And then uh, the book I did a few years ago, that this is part of a series uh, working with that material, this whole series of videos. 
And here are the four commentaries I've referred to most frequently, especially Hellerman, because he does such a good job of uh, surveying uh, many different sources, presenting a very helpful discussion of the material.